So I want to talk to you about the best practices from billions of calls. Some lessons I learned from basically reverse engineering some major VoIP services. I work for Anyet. I blog occasionally at WebRTC Hacks, so you'll find a lot of content down there for me. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I like to build things, but actually I prefer deconstructing them, reverse engineering them a lot more. So back in May 2014, Chad did an article on Amazon Mayday on WebRTC Hacks. You can read that there. It basically looked at how Amazon Mayday worked. And it was pretty important at that point that we saw that WebRTC was ready for production. And it used the WebRTC Alt library. And following that, I did a deconstruction of Hangouts when Hangouts started using WebRTC. And I looked at Firefox Hello. And at some point, I got an email from Serge saying, oh, you've done great teardowns. And he wanted to look at this shift to mobile we've seen with WebRTC back late 2014, early 2015. And we wanted to identify some best practices. And so I spent a couple of weeks looking at various services. I wrote 80 pages of reports on that, a couple of blog posts, lots of notes, and some tooling for that. And basically looking at services that have billions of calls, WhatsApp, FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, Wire, Viber, and Skype. And we learned some lessons about adaption to the mobile platform, about codec tuning, about encryption on those heavy loss 2G and 3G networks, and about ICE. So I want to talk about that. So Chad used Wireshark in his deconstruction of Mayday. And Wireshark is one of the best tools out there for decoding network packets, for analyzing stuff. And if you know how to use it, it's very powerful. However, sometimes you don't notice things. So Amazon Mayday used a certain stun server, and that information has been in this dump we had since then, and nobody noticed that it uses this net net OSA thing, which turned out to be an Acme session border controller. And also Wireshark, as good as it is, it is not very good at visualizing things. So I'll come back to this graph later, and sometimes you need better tools that can generate nice graphs that people love. So I looked at things like FaceTime, which is from Apple. It does voice chat and video chat. It works on iOS and OS X. And no surprise, it's not using WebRTC. However, it is rumored to be big. At least that's what people tell me. And they have a couple of years of deployment experience. So it's been around since 2010. And before that, it was iChat AV. So lots of experience. So they should know what they're doing. Well. We found that they're using H.264. They support H.265. However, they don't use H.265 when being on Wi-Fi. That's something where you can see that H.265, it is better in terms of bandwidth. However, it consumes more battery. So if you have enough bandwidth, don't use H.265. And they negotiate the image size between devices. So they send the optimal resolution doing that with the SDP. And of course, they use turn servers run by Akamai, distributed around the globe for low latency. And we found that they're using a very fast mechanism for the candidate allocation, which skips some round trip times. And that reduces the call setup time. And as we've heard earlier, this call setup time, the time it takes to establish the call, is very important for user experience. So I also looked at WhatsApp which does voice calls. And it's pretty big as well. So they're not using WebRTC. They're using an old library called PJSIP. They don't do this modern ICE stuff. They don't use DTLS. Instead, they use the older security description, encryption scheme. And looking at the binaries, we found that they might use some WebRTC components, like the echo canceller. However, they don't tell us if they do, even though the license would require them. So the audio codec has been a mystery for quite some while. Sahi said, oh, it's Opus, but I showed him this graph, and it basically shows how the packet lengths are distributed 
And you can see on, in black is Chrome on FRTC sending Opus, and WhatsApp is definitely looking different. So recently, someone commented on WebRTC hacks and said, oh yes, I did a man in the middle attack on the signaling traffic, and it's using Opus at a different sampling rate, which explains why this looks different. And one of the most interesting things I found was that the call is always relayed for the first few seconds. Emil told me about that, that this would be a great idea, and I found it to be true for WhatsApp. And if they can switch to peer-to-peer, -peer, they go to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. So it takes off the load of the service they have. So they're using service they call a conference bridge, 50-something in Ireland. And again, this reduces the call setup time. So I also looked at Viber, which is doing voice and video chat. It's not using WebRT. It might be using the older global IP solution stuff. And it's not using this RTP protocol. So it's completely encrypted. So when Serge asked about it, I asked him, do you really want me to look at that? Because I wasn't sure what I could find in that. And it turns out that you can still see all those traffic patterns like this graph, which shows that basically they switch from relay servers to peer-to-peer, -peer, which we've seen with WhatsApp before. I also looked at Skype, encrypted as well. However, at least they show some debug information. So we can see it's using Silk Whiteband as an audio codec. It uses h 264 video. And it was summer in Sweden. Sash had lots of time. We did some calls. and. We were testing on simulated 2G, 3G, and 4G networks. And we found that Skype really dynamically adapts things like the sampling rate, the packet frequency, and the bit rate to those network conditions. So that's very impressive. But we also found that despite those of us being in Europe, it used relay service in Redmond, which doesn't make sense to optimize one thing and not the other. We also looked at Wire, which does voice calls, text chat, and picture sharing. They have an Android app, an iOS app, and they work in Chrome and Firefox. And they use Opus, and we were interested in how do you, they adapt Opus to the mobile platform. So the browser interop is using WebRTC. They're using DTLS for encryption with very strong encryption mechanisms. And they're partially using WebRTC.org but not for networking. Like, Firefox doesn't use it for networking either. They're using the media engine and their own fixed version of libopus. And you can see that they have tuned the audio codec massively. So the bitrate in Chrome, black, and the app in blue, so the, you can see the bitrate is a lot lower in the app. Also, you see that in this packet distribution thing. So it's shifted to the left. And when testing on a simulated 3G network, we saw a drop from the usual 50 kilobit per second traffic to 25. And going to 2G, it dropped again to like 18 kilobits per second. So this is heavily tuned for a good audio experience. And this is very hard to do. However, they know what they're doing. They were involved with the ISEC codec with Opus. So these are people who know what they're doing, really. So I also looked at Facebook Messenger, which is audio and video chat, 10% of mobile voice over IP. And it is pretty apparent that it uses the WebRTC org library. They have a nice notice file showing that they use it. It works on Android, iOS, Chrome, Firefox, Opera. And in the browser, chat asked me to look at that back in January, and I told him, it's boring. Why do you want me to look at that? It's pretty common. However, on mobile, it was completely different. They've heavily tuned their app for mobile usage. And you can see that in the distribution. You can see that they send lots of small packets and lots of large packets. So adapting to those network conditions they see. And they use a lot of different audio codecs and negotiate that through STP. For example, they use the ISAC low complexity codec, which is virtually unknown outside Google. The ISAC codec when talking to Chrome, and Opus tuned for Mono when talking to Firefox. All handled through STP. And for 
encryption, this is a complicated story. So when talking to browsers, which must implement DTLS, they use DTLS. But between their apps, they used the older security description mechanism. And that allows retracted decryption, which is a bad thing. However, it is faster than DTLS in some conditions. So in summary, we learned quite a lot of best practices from those services and also things that are not so good. If you are really interested in all the gory details, all those 60, 80 pages, go to WebRTC hacks. So we saw a lot of adaption to the mobile platform, which is networks with high packet loss and delay, devices with constraints on CPU and battery usage. And we found that audio is way more important than video, and that one-one sessions are more important than multi-party. And encryption on heavy loss networks is a problem because if there is packet loss, the DTLS handshake takes a lot of time. However, while you can work around that using SDES, please don't do that. We've also seen a lot of codec tuning, that is using different codecs, lowering the bit rate, increase the frame size of the frame sent, using mono instead of stereo. And we've seen some hardware acceleration, for example, with FaceTime. However, Facebook Messenger uses VP8 on iOS in software. One of the interesting things we saw was that with ICE, a lot of people go for the relay first. So the turn server is not the last resort, but the first thing you go to. That reduces the call setup time. Then they switch to peer-to-peer -peer if they're successful. That way, you could also hide this DTLS latency in the ring latency, that is the time until the user picks up the call. So, thank you. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Hornsby Cornflower. Or you go to WebRTC Hacks <laughs> to read about stuff I write there. Great. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Do we uh, have any questions? I think you mentioned in the beginning that you need better tools than uh, Wireshark for looking at the stuff. Uh, did you write something on yourself, or? Yeah, it was. I was writing stuff based on Node PCAP, and then generating those graphs with the high charts library. It is a small set of tools, but <laughs> it is very useful. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> Search. Any suggestions on the next tool Fippo and I should test? <laughs> well, we can compare browsers. <laughs> ah, that should be interesting. There you go. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a quick question. Of, of, of all the things that you found, what was the most surprising to you? Well, I think the, that the uh, WhatsApp went for this relay service first. I mean, Emil had told me about that quite a while ago. And when I found it, I immediately thought, oh, yes, he said that. And it was good to see this used in practice. Well, FaceTime is different. They use a very complicated architecture, a combination of SIP and XMPP, and they establish a data channel and then do a SIP session over that, and it must be some very arcane reasons to do that. And very, very old architecture. <laughs> you how do you, you know more about that. <laughs> You don't want to talk about it. 